you, would you explain that as an example about your crucifixion? Like law of attraction and turning the other cheek and you being at it one minute, meaning it didn't really affect you emotionally at all? No. But physically? Um, even physically it didn't affect me. Did you have the choice to not have it, you affected or it just didn't? The, um, a lot of people talk about the crucifixion in terms of a, um, an issue of the law of attraction. The truth is that I did attract it. And the truth is, the reason why I attracted that, attra attracted that event is because inside of me I had this strong desire to, to be in a state of truth wherever I went. Now, of course, what that's going to do is attract around you lots and lots of people who are in error. Mm -hmm. And kind of truth and error always will be in disharmony with each other. Now, those people in error wanted to harm me, of course. So that was their, <laughs> that was their desire, to harm me. Now, at every single place that I went to, I had a chance to avoid that harm. But I made choices at times where I decided not to. Right? So there was a time, like three years before the crucifixion, where I was stabbed, for example, and I healed that straight away. So, you know, it didn't affect me. It didn't, it didn't have any personal emotional impact on me. In the crucifixion, the night before, before I, I died, um, uh, quite a few spirits came and warned me if I stayed in the place that I was staying in, that it would be a high likelihood I'd die. High likelihood I would die the next day. And I chose for other bigger reasons to actually stay. Yeah. Because there were, there were things that needed to be proven, which, no matter what I said, could never be proven <coughs> without somebody putting them into practice. And one of those things was, how would anybody ever believe that what I was saying about death not being of any importance? How would anybody ever believe that there was no such thing really as death? The only way was for somebody to die that they knew, and that somebody to come back and actually stand in front of them and show them that they're still alive. Okay. And that's what I chose to do. So it was a choice. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, you know, obviously I wanted to put off my death as long as I possibly could. But by that stage, what had happened is that almost every person around me still didn't believe what I was saying to them about death. Even my own soulmate did not believe what I was saying to her about death. And so in the end, the only way, once you get to a certain point in, in presenting truth, the only way you can demonstrate it is by demonstrating it with your own life. And that's what I chose to do. You're not in the same situation this time, though, are you? Well, I don't know. Maybe at some point. But I don't think so. Yeah. Most of you believe in an afterlife, do you not? Yeah, yeah. That you believe that there is something beyond? Yeah. yeah. Well, in the first century, that wasn't the case. There was this very, very hazy beliefs about afterlife, particularly amongst the Jews. Now, the Greeks were different, of course. You know, they had a lot stronger viewpoints about the afterlife. And, you know, Plato and Aristotle and all those kind of teachers that came sort of seven or eight hundred years before myself, they all taught all of those things about the soul. But, but the, Jew, the Jews and the Jewish faith were very, were very earthy. And in a lot of ways still are very earthy. That's why they focus so much upon their own country's defence. Because they're very focused on you know, what's going on in the physical. Yeah. So, yeah, so they were decisions that I'd made at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes.